What's going on guys and welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm gonna teach you all about Docker and by the end of this video, you will have a deep understanding about Docker, the different components and the different concepts of this great tool. So also we will cover almost everything and how Docker can be used in the development process and also how important using Docker and also in deployment to make our life much, much easier. So in this video, we will cover so many commands used in Docker, starting from pulling, creating images, uh, creating volumes, networking, and so on and so forth. So we will understand everything step by step. So follow me to the end of this video and by the end you will be a master of docker so with no further ado let's get started but one second if you're new to my channel just go ahead hit the subscribe button and join us so you won't miss any video that i'm publishing every week also don't forget to hit the thumb thumbs up button so we can satisfy together the youtube algorithm and help this video reach more and more people so now with no further ado let's get started first of all let's define what is a container a container is a lightweight portable and self-contained unit that packages an application along with its dependencies libraries and configuration files allowing it to run consistently across different environments containers leverage the host operating system's kernel features like namespaces and cgroups to provide isolation and resource management without the need for a full-fledged operating system like in virtual machines. Also, containers are designed to provide a consistent and reproducible environment across different, pla different platforms and development stages, and also it simplifies development, deployment, and scaling. Containers offer several benefits. First, consistency. By packaging applications along with their dependencies, container helps maintain consistent behavior across various stages of development and deployment pipelines, reducing the chains of environment-related issues. And then, portability. Containers can be easily moved and deployed across different hosts with compatible operating systems, simplifying the process of deploying and scaling applications environment envi uh, environments, including on-premises, cloud, or hybrid infrastructure. Then, resource efficiency. Containers share uh, the host operation operating system kernel and run as isolated user space processes, resulting in lower resources overhead, faster startup times, and increased application density compared to virtual machines. Then, scalability. Containers can be quickly spun up and scaled horizontally to handle varying workloads, making them a suitable choice for microservices and cloud native applications. Finally, versioning and rollback, containers enable uh, easy versioning of application components, allowing developers to roll back various versions if necessary. Docker is a popular containerization platform that uses these principles to simplify the process of building, packaging, and deploying applications as containers. Other containerization tools and platforms such as Kubernetes built on top of Docker or similar container technologies to provide orchestration, scaling, and management capabilities for containerized applications. Containers are typically stored as container images in container registries. A container image is a lightweight standalone executable package that includes everything needed to run a piece of software, including the code, runtime, system tools, libraries, and settings. Container registries are services that, stored, that store and distribute container images, allowing developers and creators to push, pull, and manage images of their application and some popular containers registries like Docker Hub, uh, Google Container Registry, AWS, Elastic Container Registries, and so on and so forth. And here we find or we have three different types of containers. We have container repositories and or we call them self-hosted registries like Nexus repository. Also, we, we can have private repositories and these um, are like private containers or private uh, containers re registries. We also have public repositories such as 
Docker Hub. And when deploying a container, a containerized application, the container runtime, like Docker for example, pulls the relevant container image from the specified registry, creates a container from the image and runs it on the host system. Docker and virtual machines are both technologies that provide isolated environment for running applications, but they differ significantly in their implementation and resource usages. And here we have a comparison of the key differences between Docker and virtual machines. So first of all, when we talk about the architecture, Docker uses containerization where applications are packaged with their dependencies and configuration in lightweight portable containers. Docker relies on the host operating system and kernel features like namespaces and cgroups to isolate containers and manage resources. On the other side, virtual machines use hardware level virtualization where each virtual machine has its own operating system libraries and application binaries. A hypervisor which runs on the host system is responsible for creating, running and managing virtual machines while abstracting the underlying hardware. Now let's talk about resource efficiency. Docker containers share the host operating system and run as isolated user space processes. This approach results in lower resource overhead, faster startup times and increased density of applications per host compared to virtual machines. Now from the virtual machine side, each virtual machine runs on full-fledged operating system, which leads, leads to higher resource, resources consumption, slower startup times and lower application density per host. The next key difference is portability. Docker containers are highly portable as they encapsulate application dependencies, configurations and runtime environment. You can easily move and run containers on different on different hosts have Docker installed provided uh, provided they have provided they have compatible host operating systems. But on the other side, virtual machines are less portable due to their dependencies on the hypervisor and underlying hardware. However, virtualization technologies like uh, open virtualization format can help to some extent in achieving portability across different hypervisors. Now let's talk about security. Docker containers share the operating system kernel, which may expose them to certain kernel level vul vulnerabilities. However, Docker offers various system uh, security features like namespaces, cgroups, and uh, seccomp profiles to mitigate risks. On the other side, virtual machines provide stronger isolation since they run independent OS instances. However, hypervisors can still be potential attack vectors if there are vulnerabilities in their implementation. Let me give you some use cases of using Docker and virtual machines. So Docker, it is well suited for microservices, cloud native applications, and situations where you need to deploy and scale application quickly with minimal overhead and virtual machines are more appropriate for running application with strong isolation requirements, legacy applications, or when you need to run multiple operating systems instances on the same host. So in summary, Docker is a lightweight resource efficient and portable solution that uses containerization while virtual machines are heavier and provide stronger isolation through the hardware level virtualization and the choice between the two technology depends on the specific requirement of your applications and infrastructure. Now let's understand what is a Docker container. So a Docker container, first of all, is a set of layers of images, as we can see in the diagram here, and mostly it's Linux based image. And it's most of the times it's Alpine because Alpine is a lightweight version of the Linux operating system. And we have here a set of layers of images and always we have the application image on the top of, of the layers. So here we have Linux based image layer and then we have different layers of the container and finally we find the application image layer. So when you pull an image, so it will first start pulling the different layers and finally it will pull the application layer. 
To install Docker, as I always recommend, go to the official documentation, just go to docs.docker.com and then click on guides right here and you will have first of all this overview where you, you will have so many information also you can get a lot of insights about what is docker what is the architecture and this we will be covering just in few moments and then to start installing uh, docker just click on manuals right here and then you will see that we, we can install Docker Desktop and it's Docker Desktop is one click install application for your Mac, Lick, Linux or Windows environment to uh, that enables you to build and share containerized applications and microservices. So to install Docker Desktop, you see on the left hand side right here, we have install Docker Desktop. So whether you are on Mac or Windows or even Linux, so just click on install and you will see uh, here the uh, download buttons so for Mac th there are two download buttons for Intel Sheep and Apple Silicon but first before click clicking on installing whether you are on Mac or Windows I invite you to have a look on the system requirements right here because here you will see if your machine will be supporting Docker or not so for example here it says that it must be uh, version 11 or newer and also it can be uh, which is Big Sur, uh, Montreal and and so on and so forth also what is the minimum required for ram and if you have some uh, something before that and then all you need to do is just to follow this installation guide in order to install docker it is really straightforward and just takes few moments to install docker and run it once you install docker i will show you later on how it looks like so also here let's go through uh, through the installation for windows here we, ha we have also docker desktop for windows and we have the requirements and what are the requirements for windows and the same for linux so after installing a uh, docker desktop on your machine you will have a, this view right here so when you start docker you will have this docker desktop application showing in here here you can see the running and the non-running containers here we can see the images we can see also the volumes and we can see the dev environment so we will walk through this interface later on but now just make sure you have docker amp and running and to make sure that docker is running you see you need to see this green uh, icon right here and also you have the pop-up engine running so install docker make sure that it's running and now let's move on to the first hands-on and the first commands that we can do within docker so after installing docker let's now make sure that you have docker up and running so open your terminal and type the command docker minus v and here if you have everything correctly installed you should see docker version popping up right here so now let's start by exploring some uh, docker basic commands like how to how to pull an image how to start a container how to stop a container how to see the logs for a specific container and so and so forth so first of all let's go to hub.docker.com which is the public repository or the public registry for all the docker containers so now on the page hub.docker.com, for example, let's search for PostgreSQL. So just type Postgres, and here you will see the list of the images or the containers that are available. So what I recommend here, just first of all, try to find the Docker official image. You'll have this official badge right here. So it will be saying Docker official image. So then let's click on it. And here we see, or we can have, all the details about uh, about this Docker image, including the tags, including um, some quick reference, what is this container, what it does, it's like a readme file, and also how to use this image. For example, this is the command to, uh, to run a Docker container or a post degree Docker container. And also you can see down here, what are the environment variables that you can pass to that container and so and so forth. So we will see all this in details. But first of all, let's copy this command right here and paste it in our terminal. And now let me show you what I mean. So now I will paste this Docker pool Postgres 
and I will hit enter. So we see, so by default, it's using the tag latest, and now it starts pulling from library slash PostgreSQL. And as I mentioned before, when, when we defined what is a Docker container, and we said that it's a layer of images, and this is what we can see right here. And when we did a Docker pull, it started uh, pulling the layers one by one. So now when you pull an image, so there are two ways to check or to see what are the available images. So first of all, we can go with the command line. So Docker images. And here we see that we have the image Postgres and the tag, it's the latest. And here we have an image ID and when this image was created. Also, you can use the Docker desktop and here in the images, we see that we have now this Postgres image already pulled, but the status is unused. So now let's use or let's create a container out of this image. So to run a container, all we need to do is to type docker run and then we can of, uh, we can say for example minus t for detached mode or without the minus t to see all the logs and this will block our terminal right here and we will not uh, be able to type any other commands because it will be just showing everything or all the logs from this docker container so let's run uh, the post degree sql container so the command is docker run and then the container name or the image name so it's postgres and then hit enter so for this one it says that the database an initialized and super user password is not specified and so on and so forth so this because when we want to run the post degree sql we need to pass some environment variables and this comes perfectly in time so let me show you if we if you want or if you need to pass some environment variables when you run a docker container so here what we need we need this post degree password so let's copy this one and then let's run the same command again. So it's gonna be docker run. And now we will paste the environment variable that we already uh, copied. So it will be docker run minus E for environment variable, and then the environment variable name equals, and then the value. So for now, let's keep it password, then let's keep it Postgres. So now I'm running the container. And as we can see here, we have a bunch of logs. So here it says the files belonging to this database will be owned by Postgres and so on and so forth. And here we see that we have a bunch of logs. And finally, we have this log message right here. Database system is ready to accept connections. So let me open a new tab in my terminal. And now let's try to find and to see what are the running Docker containers. So to see that, all we need to do is to type Docker container PS, and this will help us or will show us the list of the running containers. So here we see that we have a container ID and the image it's from PostgreSQL, and we have some commands. This already specified in the in the Docker image, and it was created 43 seconds ago. Status is up, and so on and so forth. And here we have it's it's available on port 5432, and we have a random name right here. So now, if I try to run, uh, let me let's first show you how to stop a container. So now to stop a container, we need first of all the container ID, and then Docker stop and then container ID. So hit enter. And then let's go back to the previous terminal. And we see that it's no longer blocked. The container has stopped and it's no longer running. So now let's type again docker ps. And now we see that we don't have any running container. So what about if we want to see all the running and all the non running containers. So it's docker ps and we need to, to add a parameter or an option minus a to minus a is to say all and here we see that we have two containers post degree sql and each one of them is with a different name so now if i run again let me clear this one so now if i run again the um, the container we see that it's running and we have the system is ready to accept connection now if i go back and run docker ps minus a again 
we see that we have three containers. So th with this one, you need to really pay attention. So each time you execute the docker run command, it will start a new docker container. It will create a new docker container. So if you have some specific things with that, just be careful with it. So I will explain it in a few seconds how we can rerun the same container without having duplications or like without having multiple containers at the same time for the same image. Before moving forward with other Docker commands, let's first understand what happens when we run a Docker pool or a Docker run command. So here we have, this is how the Docker architecture looks like. So we have the client, which is us and our operating machine. And we have also the Docker host, which is our local machine. So the, the client is the command line interface or the terminal. And then we have our Docker host, which is our local machine or a server where Docker is running. And we have on the right hand side, we have the registry where we have the different Docker images. So when we execute a Docker pool, so first of all, it will connect to the Docker daemon and it will check if we have the image or not. And then it will go to the registry, pull the image and then store it on the, on the host. So then when we run the command Docker run and we specify the parameters and the, the container name. So first of all, it will go and connect to the Docker host, check also, if we have the image available here, if yes, it will create a container out of this image. Otherwise, it will go and pull the, pull the image from the registry and then store it. And after that, it will be running into a container. So this is how it looks like. Now, let me show you what happened when we run Docker uh, run command without having any image on our Docker host. So for that, let's go back to our Docker hub. And this time let's search for example, for Redis. So here let's go to the official uh, image and then we have this Docker pool Redis and let's scroll a bit down and we have here Docker run. Let's copy this command and let's go back to our terminal. And now I will paste the image, but I will, I will remove the detached mode. And also I will remove the, the name. I will just keep Docker run Redis and let's see what will happen. So we see, first of all, it's unable to find image Redis locally, and then it started already pulling from library slash Redis, and now it's pulling all the layers of our Docker image. And then it created uh, a Docker container out of it. So here we have ready to accept connections. So let me stop this. So in order to stop a running container, just hit Ctrl C. And now we have Redis now is ready to exit. Bye bye. So when I run Docker PS minus A again, so I see here we have my Redis image. After understanding uh, the Docker architecture and how the pool and run commands really works from the background, now let's go ahead and explore some more commands. So I will run again uh, a Docker run for PostgreSQL. And here we see that database system is ready to accept connection. So I'm going to stop this one and then I will try to list all the running containers. So as we can see right here, we don't have any running containers. So let's list them all. And now what if we want to run an already existing Docker container? So for example, this is the latest one that we, uh, that we were running. So now to start a Docker container, just copy the container ID and type Docker start and then container ID. And now you will have the Docker running in detached mode. So if I do Docker PS again, we see that we have this Docker container running and it's up and listening on this port. So now again, to stop the, the same container, it's Docker stop and then container ID. So now we stopped the container. So let me run it again. So now we have our Docker container running again, just to make sure Docker PS and we have this container. So now what if I want to see the logs that I have uh, running uh, on that running container? So all I need to do is just Docker logs and then I need to type the container name. So the container name is this one. So I'm just going to copy it 
paste it in here and hit enter. So we see that we have all these logs and here it's listening on port something and then we have database system is ready to accept connection which was the last log. So now if I want also to uh, to display the logs but in um, let's call it blocking mode so here we, we see that we can type another command it's just displaying the latest logs but now if I want to keep listening on the logs that will happen on that container it's again docker logs and now we will add an option minus f and then again the docker name or the container name so hit enter now we see that if, if we do anything on that uh, on that container, we will see all the logs displaying right here. Again, to exit that, it's just you need to type command C to exit the logs. So again, let's make sure that our container is still running. Now I will show you a command that, that might be really useful. So if I want, so uh, the question is, what if I want to uh, run some commands inside the container and see what I have inside, okay? So to do that, we need to run um, the, we need to run the container or to log into the container in an interactive mode. So to do that, we need to type the command docker exec. So execute minus IT for interactive terminal. And then we need the container name, which is this one. So let's copy it. And then after the container name, we need to pass the mode how we want to connect. So for example, for the PostgreSQL, it's PSQL. And then we need also, this is uh, PostgreSQL uh, specific uh, command. I'm talking about the PSQL and then the minus U and we need to pass the PostgreSQL user name. So uh, by default, as we mentioned before, and as we saw in the beginning, so when you run a Docker uh, container for PostgreSQL, the username by default is Postgres, Postgres. So now hit enter and we see that we are inside the Docker container. So now we can execute and we can run commands inside the container itself. So it's like you are interacting directly with this database system. So for example, if I type um, backslash L to list all the databases. So here we see that we have this da da default database, we have this template zero, template one, and so on and so forth. Now let's try, for example, to create a database and let's call it Alibu and then semicolon. So here create database. And if I type again minus L, we see that we have our database already created. Also, we can perform many operations uh, like, for example, uh, listing listing the tables, uh, listing everything. So did not find any relation. So because we don't have any tables yet, you can create tables, you can run SQL queries, you can do whatever you want inside the container. So now to exit this interactive mode, we need to type the command exit. So now we see that we are no longer inside the container. And again, if I type docker logs minus F, or let's just type docker logs and then container name, hit enter, we see that we have database uh, is running and so on and so forth. And we will be able to see all the logs that happened inside that container. So again, let's list all the running containers and we have this one is already running. So now what if I want to run a container with a custom name? So first let's stop this one and then docker stop and then container ID. And now let's reuse the same, uh, the same docker run command that we had before. So here, we have docker run and we can pass the environment variables if they are required and then the container name. So now we can pass another option, which is minus minus name and let's call it Alibu Postgres, for example. And now hit enter. And you see that the container is running and it's ready to accept connections. Let me stop it. And now let's run docker ps minus a to see all the running containers. And now we see that we have this container with the name that we already specified. So this is how you can run a container with a specific name. So now let me show you how to run it in detached mode. So the same way, 
I will give it a name detached, for example, and then I need to pass another option, which is minus D to say detached. So when we hit detached, it will just give us a SHA or a, or a hashed code. And now if I do Docker PS, we see that we have this Alibu Postgres detached. All right, so now what if I want to remove a container? So if I need to delete, for example, this one or uh, this one, so we need, of course, the container ID, not the container name. So let me copy this one. And then it's Docker RM, uh, RM, sorry. So it's Docker remove and then container ID. And then hit enter. So we see that the container was removed. Is If I do again, Docker PS minus A, and hit enter so we see that we no longer have this container so now let me also uh, let me try to remove all of them so again docker remove this one and then this one and also let's remove this so i'm trying to remove all the containers that we have and now let's type docker ps minus a and we see that we only still have three running containers so let me also delete this one and again i will delete this this one so for this one, I was not able to remove it because if I run Docker PS, it's the running container. So you cannot remove a running container. So again, I will just type Docker PS minus A. And here we see that we have only two containers. One is running and the other one is not running. So let me remove this one. Docker remove and this container. And again, Docker PS minus A. Sorry, it's just minus a and we see that we have only one container remaining so now let's see what images we have if we remove a container does it remove an image or not so i will type docker images and here we see that we have redis and we have postgres sql so this means that when we remove a container it does not remove the image with it. So now what if I want to remove an image? So let's say I want to remove this Redis image. So I will copy the ID or even the image name. So Docker and now remove and we need to add I. So for se to say Docker remove image and then the Docker ID. So here if I do Docker images again, we see that we still have only the Postgres image. So also we can also remove uh, remove that one or we can just keep it because we will need it for further commands. So before moving forward and explore more and more commands, let's recap the list of commands that we learned in this video. So first to pull an image, all we need to do is docker pool and then the image name, for example, Redis. And this one, it will pull by default the latest one. But what if I want to pull a specific a specific image or specific version? So let's go back to uh, Docker Hub. And now, for example, with this uh, with this Redis image, let's try to pull. Uh, let's say, OK, let's say this version. Let's say the version uh, 6 to 12 or 6.2. And now let's go back to the terminal. And then all we need to do is Docker pool and then colon. 6.2 and then we pull and here let me show you what we have so because we explained before that a docker image is a set of layers of images so here we see that we have three layers that already exists and then it was just pulling three other layers or three different layers which are specific for the redis 6.2 now if i type docker images we will see that we have two versions of Redis. So we have the first one, it's 6.2, which is we just the one we just pulled. And we have another one, which is the latest, which is the one we pulled in the beginning. So now let's, uh, let's remove, for example, this one, and let's stick only to the latest. So Docker RMI, and then image name. So again, Docker images. And now we have only this one. So let me clear this, 
now to run a container out of an image. So it's docker run. And then we can pass the options. So first, let's say, for example, minus D for detached mode. And then let's give it a name. So Redis container, for example. And then the image name, Redis. So now this is going to run or this is going to create a container out of this Redis image. So Docker PS to list all the running containers. And here we see that we have Postgres, which is already running. And we have this new container that we just started. So now again, to stop a container, we need the container ID. So Docker stop and then Docker, uh, the Docker container ID and then hit run. And again, let's do Docker PS and we still see that we have only Postgres running. So now if I want to start a container, we need again the container ID and Docker start and then container ID. So Docker PS again, just to make sure that we are, our container is running. So now if I want to, um, to see the logs of a running container, it's Docker logs and then container name. Okay. So we called it Redis container. And now we see that we have the logs, but the logs, it, it will just display the latest logs and that's it. So if we want to keep listening on the logs for a specific container, we need to add the option minus F. So here we are, we keep listening on all the logs that will happen on this container. So to exit this command C or control C for windows, uh, for windows users. So let me list the, the Docker containers again. I need this one. So now let's, Again, let me remind you how to execute or how to connect to a running container. So it's docker exec minus it for interactive terminal and then container name and then psql for postgresql and then minus u and postgres as a user. And now we are inside, uh, inside the container itself. And as I mentioned before, we can run uh, multiple commands like for example, I want to list all the databases and so on and so forth. But here there is something that we can see. So here we already created a database before, but we don't, we no longer see the database in here. So this is going to introduce us to the next topic that we will see together, which is Docker volumes. So let's exit this container and let's move on to understand the Docker volumes. We saw before that when we restart or when we remove a container, we lost the data that we have. And in the example that we saw before with that we created a database, but when we restarted the container, the data was lost and the database was also, was also lost. And now what we need to solve this issue, we need to have volumes on the Docker container. So first of all, let's understand, um, this philosophy. So we know that a container it runs on a host machine and a container has its own virtual file system. So for example, for PostgreSQL, we have a virtual file system called slash var slash lib slash Postgres slash data. So this is where the container is going to store all the data that we will do on that container. So for example, creating a database, creating tables, inserting and so on and so forth it will be automatically stored on the container. So in order to solve this issue and to have also a persisted volumes or a persisted data, in case we restart or we remove the container, we want to keep this data and we don't want to lose this data. And the best use case is what we are talking about right here is a database. So we don't want to lose our data each time we restart or each time we start an even a new container. So what I want to have is even if I launch many containers, I want to mount them and I want to point them to the same data. So how this works? We explained that the container has its own virtual file system. And now we need to mount this virtual file system to a physical file system, which is on our host machine. 
So here we have our physical file system. Let's say, for example, it's going to be slash user sampath slash data. This is where I want to store all the data coming from this container. So the folder in physical file system is mounted into the virtual file system of Docker, which is the container. So we need a kind of plug. And when we plug uh, these two volumes, the physical file system and the virtual file system from our container, we will have an automatic replication of our data. So each time the container writes a data into uh, its virtual file system, this data will be automatically replicated into the physical file system. And this is how it works. And this is also how we can achieve this goal and avoid data loss. When we talk about Docker volumes, we mainly talk about three types of Docker volumes. So the first one is called host volume, and this can be mounted when we run, for example, the Docker run minus V this for volume. And then we can reference host container or the host path and the container path. So this works in a way that you can decide where on the host you want to reference the container volume. And this type of reference means that Docker will store all the container data on the specific path that you will specify on the host file system. The second type of volumes is called anonymous volume. So it's, it's written like that. It's Docker run minus V and then you just specify the, the, the volume path on the container. And this means that for each container, a folder is generated and gets mounted. And this folder is automatically created by Docker. So the folder will be created on the host and it will be automatically mounted to the container volume path. And the last type is named volumes. And this named volumes is an improvement for the anonymous volumes. So all we need to do is just to run the Docker command, Docker run minus V. And here you can just give a name, any name you want, and then you will mount it to the container volume right here. So this is just, you can just reference the volume by name and you don't have to know where the path or where Docker is going to create the path. So also as a recommendation, named volumes is the one you should be using in production for many reasons. It uh, improves performance, maintainability and data management. So now let's see in action how we can mount a volume. So first of all, let's make sure that we don't have any running container. So first let me stop them, stop all of them. So Docker stop this one and then Docker stop Postgres. All right, so now we have no containers running. So let me first start a new Docker container or a new Postgres Docker container. So let me also remove this one and I'm gonna remove the other one. So Redis, so it's Docker RM for removing. So here, if I do Docker PS minus A, we don't have any containers running or even stopped. So now let's run a container with a volume. So we will use Docker run, and then let's give a name for our container. Let's call it Postgres dash SQL. And then we need, of course, the environment variable, which is post Postgres underscore user uh, password, sorry, the username is not mandatory, equals, let's say for now, password, and then minus V, and let's give it a volume. So the volume, it will be slash users slash alibu slash docker. And I want to create, so even if this Docker folder doesn't exist, Docker will create it for us. So let's say Docker and then volumes, and then let's say Postgres and then data. Okay. And this one will be mounted to slash etc. Uh, sorry, it's slash var slash lib slash Postgres slash data. And then of course we need Postgres or the image name. So here we are mounting this path on our host machine to the slash var slash lib slash Postgres slash data. So let's run the container. And now we see that the database system is ready to accept connection, means that the container is up and running. So let me stop this one or exit this one. And let's do Docker PS. So now we don't have any running containers, Docker PS minus A. 
and here we have our container so i will start it again so docker start and then container id now let's connect to our to our container so i will do docker exec minus it and then we need the postgres dash sql so this is the name of our running container and then psql and then minus u and then we need the username so which is by default postgres so if you define a different name make sure you you also uh, name it so here we are connected to postgres now let's list all the databases we see we only have the default ones so let's create a new one so create database and let's call it alibu semicolon so now let's list again the databases so we see that we have this alibu database now let me exit this container and i will do docker stop so now the container is stopped so if i do docker ps i have no running container i will start it again so now again if i connect uh, interactively to the container and try to list the databases we see that we have this alibu data database already exists so we didn't lose the data now let me show you how we can create anonymous volumes so let's exit this one so now again we will use the same uh, command we used the docker run so now all i need to do is just to remove this part right here that reference my physical file system so i would just keep this one so i want to create uh, a container let's change the name so this one let's call it anonymous and i want to i want docker to choose automatically the path for me so let's run it so here we have docker or database system is ready to accept connection also we can run it for the next time we can run it in, de in detached mode so we can also keep using our terminal so i will just exit it and docker ps minus a just i want to run my container so this is the one that we created and then docker start so now i will try to connect to um, to my container so we called it anonymous sorry we called it postgres sql dash anonymous so and now let's try to list the databases so here we since docker uh, is responsible of choosing the path where, where it wants to mount the physical uh, volume to the to the container volume so we don't have this database now let's exit the container and let's see how also we can create a named volume so again let me stop this container so instead of start i just want to stop it and now let's use again the same command docker run so now let's also call it postgres sql named and i will add minus t for detached mode now let's make sure our container is up and running so here we see that we have this named container is running so now let's connect to it so instead of anonymous let's call it let's uh, use the named one and now let's list the databases so also when we use the named one docker automatically Oops, sorry. Uh, we just typed the wrong uh, the wrong command. So let's say Docker PS. Let's remove the or let's totally delete this one. So first Docker stop this container and Docker remove this container. So let's go back again. So for this named, so here we forgot to type uh, named volume. So minus v named underscore volume for example and then colon and without spaces so now if i run the container i do docker ps again so we see that we have our named container so let's connect to our named container and let's list the databases so here we see also that we don't have this database uh, we the database called alibu we, we previously created because we have a new volume which was created automatically by docker so this is how you can create uh, or map volumes to a docker container and we saw the three types of docker volumes now let's move on and see how we can use docker in, within applications or to make our life 
easier when we work with Docker. So first let's exit this container and let's move on. Before moving forward, let me tell you a story. How our life was before containers and how our life improved after containers. And we will cover both development and deployment phases. So here, how we used to work before containers. So here we have a team composed of three developers and each one of them is working on a different operating system. So now to set up our working environment, we need to install different tools on different or on each machine. And here we have different installation process for each operating system because it's not the same to install on Ubuntu, Mac, or even Windows. And it was really hard to reproduce the same issue on different environments. So for example, if this developer is facing some issue, it's not really straightforward to reproduce the same uh, the same error or the same issue on a different operating system. Also, for example, it works correctly on, on this laptop, but something is, is wrong or something is not correctly operating on different systems. And even if we, uh, if we want to debug and if we want to reproduce something, it really has so many steps if something goes wrong. So this is how our life was before. So I call it ice ages, but it was, it was exactly like that. So now let me show you how containers improved our daily daily work or our daily life because containers made our life much, much easier. And let me walk you through it. So after containers, all we need to do is to pull or to run a container. And this container has a bunch of configurations, scripts, and also the application that we want to run. So what benefits they come within uh, within the containerization. So first of all, we have an isolated environment. So the environment doesn't really depend on the operating system, but it depends only on the host. Also, we can package with the required configuration. So for example, if we have something uh, special for PostgreSQL or for, for, our, uh, for our database, all we need to do is to create a container out of this one and we set up the configuration that we need and also the scripts that we want to run at the application or at the container startup. And one of the one of the best benefits is that we have one same command to install and run the application. So because everyone will be working using container and Docker, for example, so all we need to do is just Docker commands. So we have the same command for everything or for each operating system. And the last one is running on different environments and versions. So we, we no longer have conflicts. We no longer need uh, many steps to configure our work, working station and our working environment. So that was about our daily life development. So now let's talk or let me explain to you how was deployment before. So this diagram is honestly from my personal experience and it was a really experience. As I mentioned before, it was really like ice ages. So before, as a developer, we need to provide the, for example, the WAR file or the JAR file that we want to deploy, a bunch of configuration. Also, we need to have some uh, text documentation for deployment. So we need to send all these documents to the to the operation guy that he will deploy the application. Also, we need to mention the different versions that we need, for example, for a database. And if we have any configuration required for the for the database to make everything run and it was working and it's already working on my machine. So this is where this uh, sentence came from, because the developer, when he set up his environment, he knows his machine and he he's already installing everything and also for example, we can install some tools or some dependencies and we forgot, we forget to mention this one in the deployment documentation. And then we send all this to the deployment guy or to the operation uh, team. So this is an ops, he's not a DJ. So, and then the DJ will follow uh, will follow the text documentation to deploy the application. But before that, he needs to set up the server, configure everything, install all the required dependencies, and so and so forth. But for some times, or to be honest, well, not most of the times, because we need to have a well-documented deployment process and so on and so forth. But for some times, the deployment is not working and the application is not running and we run into issues. So here, what was the, the disadvantages? So first of all, we need to configure server 
and then we have really text documents for deployment and we of course have version conflicts and sometimes a misunderstanding between this deployment documentation and what the developer needs to do in order to deploy the application and it was a bit a real mess between the developers and the operating uh, and the operations uh, team so it was really it was not a real friendly environment between us but containers really solved that issue and let me walk you through it now how it became after containers so after containers all we need to do is to provide a container with the necessary uh, with the, with the packaged application all the required configurations and dependencies and finally we are friends so dev and ops are finally friends and we work together as a team also there is no environment configuration on the server because the server all we need to have is having docker installed and then just run the command docker pool and then docker run and we will automatically pull the container and make it run so life became so much easier and finally we are friends with the ops and now we call we call it devops so dev developers and operations are finally friends and they work together as a team so now let's see in action how containers can make our development life or our daily life much much easier now let me show you and explain to you how docker containers or how containerization can be really useful to make our development life and our daily coding life much much easier so here we have uh, our postgres container running so as we can see here it's uh, it's a running one and i check that with using the docker ps command so now as a developer i want to build an application that will connect and store data in my in my docker or in my postgres sql database so i already configured volumes as we saw before so now my container is persistent and so on and so forth so everything is set up i have all the uh, all the required configurations and all the necessary scripts running and my container is up and running in the way that i'm expecting to so now first let's go to um for example i will be using IntelliJ because as as you know me and as you know my style i want to have everything in one place so i will use IntelliJ to connect to this postgres sql and i will start running some commands creating tables databases and so and so forth so here on IntelliJ so if you have the ultimate version you will have this icon right here database and now let's connect to our database so first of all i will add a new data source so here postgres sql and then the host is localhost because it's running on my local machine and the port this is the default port for postgres sql so here for the username we said that we we want the default one which is postgres and then the password we matched it as password so now to make sure that everything is working all we need to do is just test connection so if i click on test connection i will see if i'm able to connect to that container or to the running container or not so i will click on test connection and here the first thing that we see we have failed so it's failed to connect to the database so here it says connect connection to localhost uh, 5432 refused check that the host name and port are correct and the and the postmaster is accepting tcp uh, tcp ip connections so this means like in a simple way we need to make sure that our database system or our dbms is up and running which is already the case but we are not able to connect to it and the reason why we are not able to connect to postgres sql is that postgres sql is running but it's running in an isolated uh, environment uh, belongs to docker and we need to expose ports so now our container is up and running it's accepting connection but it accepts connection only from inside the docker environment so let me explain to you wh how, how this works so now this is how docker containers looks like so this is our host and then we have different containers running so for example our postgres sql is running on the port 5432 and this is this is what we see when when we run the docker the docker command docker ps and we check the port but this port is only available inside the docker environment 
and it's not exposed outside. So here we have multiple containers they can run on a host and a host has a certain ports available. So here we need to expose them. The problem here, we have another issue is, for example, I want to have two instances or two containers from PostgreSQL, whether within the same version or even a different version, and I want to use both of them. So in this case, we need to create a binding, but we need to bind with different ports. So internally, now, so here, this part right here is, we talk about the, the Docker, um, the Docker environment or the isolated environment for Docker. And here we can have the same container running on two ports. So it's not a problem, but when it comes to the host, uh, to the host and the port that we want to expose for the host, we cannot expose two times the same, the same port. So if we do that and we try, for example, to bind, the same port, for example, uh, 5432 on the host, we will have or we get the message uh, port already in use, try to choose a different one. So now let me show you uh, how we can expose containers to our host to be able to connect to them. So first of all, I will stop this container. So Docker stop and I need the container ID. And then I will also remove that container because I will create a new one. So Docker remove and then container ID. So now I will be using uh, one of the previous commands that we used before. So this is the command that I will be using to create a new Docker container for uh, Postgres SQL. And then I will need to add one parameter. So here we have Docker run and we gave it a name Postgres SQL and we, we passed the environment variable, which is Postgres password, and we also mounted it to, to a volume. So here, after the name, I will add another option, which is minus P, and now I will expose a port from my host or from my local machine to the Docker environment. So here, I want to expose 5.4, uh, sorry, I need the space, so it's 5.4.3.2, colon, 5432. So the the left hand side, so this first part is the host port and this one is the container port. So as we can see here, the port is running on, um, the container is running on the port 5432 and now I want to expose the same port for my host. So you can choose a different one, any port you, you want, but just make sure you don't have the same or you're not using the same port again. Otherwise, you might run into issues. So let's run the container. And also I will add minus D for detached mode and let's run our container. So now let's make sure our container is up and running. So we see here we have the, the container ID from this image and so on and so forth. And now we see something different comparing to this one. We see something different. So here, this is the local machine. So because it's 0.0.0, .0 so this is the local address and it's exposed on this port 5432. So now let me run again the same command, but I will just change the, the name. So let me call it new and I will expose a different port. So 1234, for example, as a port that I want to use on my host machine. So let's run it. Let's Docker PS again. So we can see that we have two containers running on different ports for the host, but internally they are using the same port, which is 5432. Now let's go back and try to connect to one of them. So now I still have the same configuration right here. So it's Postgres and the password, I chose password for it. And now if I try test connection, we see that our connection is succeeded. Also, if I change, for example, and I use the other one or the different port that we exposed and I do try connection, we also that we see we have a succeeded connection. So now every time you want to use a port from your host machine, you need to expose a port. So now let's add this one. And we see that we have here our, our connection. So now we can do whatever we want. We can create a database. So for example, let's say Alibu, and we can even uh, execute interactively our container and we can check that we have everything. So now let's check again, which one we used. So we used the one, one, two, three, four. So I will just move it back to five, four, three, two, test connection, connection succeeded, apply and then okay. So now I can just use a different one. 
but here we see also that this database Alibu does not exist because we switched to a different container so don't worry about that so we will clean up everything later on and we will see what we can how we can use this one in real development application before we move on let's first understand what a docker file is so a docker file is a text file containing a series of instructions that define how to build a docker image for a specific application or service so the instructions or commands in the docker file specify the base image dependencies configuration and other required components to create a fully functional container Docker reads the Docker file when we issue the docker build command and it follows the instruction to create the image step by step. This image can be used to create and run containers. So as I explained before, docker images are made of multiple layers which are created by the various commands in the docker file. These layers are stacked on top of each other forming the final image. So let's discuss some common docker file instructions and the layers they create. So first of all we have the from. So this instruction specifies the base image from which the new image will be built. So the base image can be an official image like Ubuntu, Alpine or Node or a custom image created by the user. The from instruction creates the first layer of the image. Then we can have the run command. So the run instruction executes commands in, few, uh, in new layers on top of the current image. So it is often used to install software packages, libraries or other dependencies required for the application. Each run command creates a new la layer, so it's recommended to combine multiple related commands using the AND operator to minimize the number of layers and reduce the overall image size. Then we have the copy and add instruction. So these instructions copy files or, their, uh, or directories from the host file system to the container file system. So the copy is preferred method because it is more transparent and has fewer features while add can also fetch remote files and unpack archives. Each copy or add command creates a new layer in the image. Then we have the command work dir. So the work dir instruction sets the working directory for subsequent instruction in the docker file such as run cmd entry point copy and add so it can be used to organize the application files within the container this command creates a new layer only if the specified directory doesn't exist in the previous layer so if we have a new folder that we need to create so this work directory will create a layer and this layer will contain the new folder that you specify then we have the environment or the env instruction so this instruction sets environment variables that can be used by the application or other instructions in the docker file so the env command creates a new layer so it's recommended to group to group related environment variables in a single env instruction then we have expose. So the expose instruction informs Docker that the container listens to the specified network ports at runtime. So this doesn't create a new layer, but provides the metadata for the image. And finally, we have CMD and entry point instructions. So these instructions define the default command that will be executed when a container is run from the image. They can be overridden when starting the container using docker run, cmd and entry point do not create a new layer, but they store the command information in the image metadata. So to create an efficient docker image, it's essential to understand the layering mechanism and use it in your advantages. So minimizing the number of layers and leveraging caching can significantly reduce build times and image sizes. By understanding the different instructions in the docker file and how they contribute to the image layers, you can build optimized images that are perfect for deployment in various environments. To show you a bit more how we can use containers for our development applications, so here what I did be, uh, before I start recording this part, 
I just created a new Docker container and then I gave it a name Postgres SQL, exposed the same port 5432 and I give it a username and a user uh, a password. So the password is password and the username is username. Also, I passed another environment variable, which is Postgres database. So this means that at the container startup, Postgres will create a database called DemoDB. And then I chose to have a persistence in a specific uh, location and then Postgres. So here, if I do Docker PS, we see that we have our Postgres up and running. So now if we go back to our IntelliJ, so this is the demo project that I already created, which is ready to use. And now just let me show you the database. So here we have our connection and we have our demo database right here. So now if I run the application, so let me first walk you quickly through this application. So I have a simple repository and a simple, a simple entity right here, just with an ID name and description. And I created the controller to expose three endpoints, get mapping, post mapping, and get by ID. And then I have my demo application or the main uh, class where I injected or created a bean to insert a new line into our table. So now I will run the application locally and see if everything works fine. So now I'm just running the application from my IntelliJ and we see that we have uh, everything. We have the, the table getting created. Also, we have the data getting inserted. So to make sure that everything works fine, I will open my database right here, refresh it. And then of course I need to select the public schema. And then I have my demo entity table with the line that I just inserted. So Docker tutorial for beginners and the name is Docker. So everything is up and running locally. Now let's see how we can package or how we can create an image out of this spring uh, Java application. So first I will stop the application and close everything. And now let's open this. So in order to create or to package our application into a Docker image. So first of all, we need to create a file. So let's create it on the root folder. So I will call it Docker file. So the, the name should be just Docker file. And then we will see what we will put inside this Docker file. But first we need to package our application. So let me show you what we have right here. So this is the group ID, the artifact, the version and so on and so forth. And this is our application name. So now all I need to do is to run in the command line. So now all I need to do is to package my Spring Boot application and I will be using dot slash MVN wrapper clean package. So this is just for packaging the application. And if you're new with Spring Boot and if you want to learn more about Spring Boot, I will invite you to check my YouTube channel where you can have many useful videos about Spring Boot and how you can get started with that. If you are already familiar, let's move on. So now we have our uh, application package. And if I check the target folder, I see that I have my demo 1.0.jar file which is the, the package or the running or the executable file of my application. So let's put this aside and we'll come back to it later on. So now to create an image out of this application. So what we said before, we said that an image or a Docker image or a Docker container is a set of layers of images. So we said that the base image would be always uh, or most of the times is uh, a Linux, Linux uh, image. So first we need to tell what is the base image for our new container. So now, first of all, we want from, so because, uh, in, uh, because in order to run a Java application, all we need to do is to have JDK. Okay. So now let's say we want it from open JDK and then we can specify a version. So here, since our application is a Spring Boot 3 application, we need minimum Java 17. So let's say open JDK 17 JDK. So this is the tag or the version of the base image that we want to use. And now the next step is we need to copy this jar file into the Docker image that we want to build. So let's use the copy command and then we want to copy from this target folder. So it will be target slash and then demo 
dash 1.0.jar and we want to copy it to slash for example we want to create inside the container we want to create a folder and we want to call it app and then slash demo dot java uh, sorry dot jar not java so now what we are doing is we are copying this jar file into the docker image so this is what we mean by creating a container or creating a docker image so we want to package our application and make it ready to ready to use also by default our application is running on port 8080 so let's expose also that port on the container side and then we need to specify a command to execute our jar file so you know in java if you want to run a jar file is just so here we have a cmd command and in this command all we need to do is to do java minus jar and then the, the jar file name so demo dot jar so the demo it refers to this file right here not this one so this one it will just copy from the host to the docker image all right so then we need to run this command in order to run our application now we have our docker image ready let's now try to package or let's try to build an image out of this out of this full application and let's try to run it as a container so now i will be using the my internal command line so here we are in the same uh, in the same folder now to build an image we have the command docker build and then we need to give or to specify the docker file so if you named your docker file as like this docker file you just need to pass dot and now when you hit enter it will start building an image out of this configuration so this configuration we call it blueprint and it's the blueprint or the steps or what we need to specify in a docker file in order to create a docker image out of it so let's analyze the the logs so first of all we have a building finished seven steps out of seven so load uh, build definition from docker file transforming and so on and so forth and then what we have it's load metadata for docker io and how here we are specifying or we are using the open jdk 17 that we specified in here and then the next step is is copying this file right here into this location so this is the second step or the second command that we specified and then we are exposing a port and so and so forth so now if i do docker images we see that we have this one from redis and this one from postgres and we see that we have a new image created 53 seconds ago which is the one that we just built but it has no repository and it has no tags why because when we build an image we need to give it a tag so to give a tag to an image so let's say minus t and then i will call it spring slash demo for example so now let's rebuild the image again and now if i do docker images we see that we have the spring demo latest so now i can create a container out of this image so i can do docker run and then the container or the image name so we, we, we named it spring slash demo and then let's hit enter and see what will happen so first of all we have a response from daemon failed to create this and that so here unable to start container process executable file is not found in path so this means when we try to run this java minus jar command and it, it's not able to find a file called demo.jar because by default we are in the root of our container so whether we need to navigate to this app and then run this command so we need to have or to execute two different commands or we need to set our working directory so if we change the working directory to this one we will be able to execute commands at that location so let's do that so to to define a working directory we have a command called work dear and then slash app so this means when we want to execute a command from here it will be executed inside this dot slash app folder or what you can also do if you want if you don't want to use this work directory just remove this one and copy this one to the root location but let's keep it like that because i want to give you 
as much information as I can. So now what we need to do, we need to rebuild again our image. Let's rebuild it with the same tag. And then let's check our images. So we see we have now our uh, new image created two seconds ago because it will be overriding the old one. Now if I run my container, so let me clean this one and let's see what will happen. So now again we have an error message. So we are not able to execute this command and this because we have a command with, uh, with options or with parameters and we need to separate them. So it should be Java and then comma and the first argument which is minus jar and then our jar file name. So now if we build again our application and now if I run the application, we will, we will see that we have a spring, uh, the spring logo uh, popping up and now we have all the logs from our application. But there is something really important that I want to show you here. So here we have connection to localhost 5432 refuse check that the host name and port are correct and that the postmaster is accepting and so on and so forth. So this, if you remember, that was the same error message that we had before when we first tried to uh, try to connect to our PostgreSQL SQL inside Docker. So now this problem is because we don't have a network be between our Spring Boot application and our Postgres SQL container. And in order to fix that and make the application running, what we need to do, we need to create a network. And this is going to introduce us to the next topic, which is Docker networking. So now let me show you how you can communicate different Docker containers between each other. So first of all, let's understand Docker networking. So when we create a Docker container, so it will be running in an isolated Docker network. And then both containers, they will be able to communicate through the Docker container name. So for example, here we call it, we call our Postgres SQL container name, Postgres SQL, and we want our Spring application to connect to our Postgres SQL container. So both of them will be running inside a Docker isolated network. And in order to ensure a connection, we need to connect both of them to the same network. So now let's go back and create a network and connect these two applications to the same network and ensure communication. And let's make sure that our application is up and running and that we are able to insert data and also to create data from our Spring Boot application. So first of all, we need to make a small change to our Spring Boot application configuration. So here, instead of connecting to localhost, it needs to connect to Postgres-SQL, which is the container name. And here, if I do Docker PS, we see that we have Postgres running and the, and the container name is Postgres SQL. So now first we ensured that our Spring Boot application will be connecting to this Docker. Now let's build again our application. So again, MVN wrapper clean package. So this will generate a new jar file with this new configuration to make sure that our application will correctly connect to that one. So here I will just remove all the tests because I don't need them for the moment. So I will comment this out and also this one and let's package again our application. So here we have build success and we have our new jar file. So now let's build the Docker image again. So again, if I check with the command Docker images, I see that we have our spring demo created four seconds ago. We can also remove all these ones, but let's keep them for the moment. Now, let me show you how to create networks and to connect each container or like both containers to the same network. So first, in order to check the list of the available networks that we have, we can just run Docker network ls to list all the networks that we have. So here we have three networks. Now let's create a new network. So it's docker network create 
and then let's call it Spring Boot Network. So now if I do Docker Network LS again, I see that I have my new network and by default it will give it the type bridge. So now after creating the network, let's connect our Postgres SQL container to this network. So what I need to do is Docker connect. So Docker network connect and then the network ID or the network name, which is Spring Boot Network and then space the container name. And then hit run. And now we have our Docker container for Postgres SQL connected to the Spring Boot network. Now let me show you how also you can run a Docker container and connect it manually to a specific network. So this is how you can connect a running container to a new network. Now let me show you how we can run a, a Docker container and provide or specify the network that we want to use. So again, I want to, to run a new container. So Docker run and then minus minus net for network and then the network name, which is Spring Boot Net and then the image name. So it's Spring slash demo. And then let's hit enter and see what will happen. So now we see that the application is up and running and also we have create table and we have the insert statement that we had before. So now our application is up and running and the Spring Boot application is connecting to the Postgres SQL through the Spring Boot network. But now I want to ask you a question. Are we able to query this running API through our Postman, for example? I want you to think about the answer and I will give it just in, in the second section. So now if I try to query the, the, REST, the running REST API, just let me remind you, the REST API is up and running. And now if I try to query it using Postman, for example, and I click on send, we see that we have connection refused because we are not able to access this application on this address and this port. And I guess you already guessed the answer because we did not expose a port to our host machine when we ran the application. So let me run it again. So here I will make it or I will add the option port and let's say I want to expose 8080 on port 8080 or let me show you how we can expose a different port. And now let's run our application. So the application is again up and running and let's go to our postman and click on send again. And here we need to change the port. It should be 8088. And now when I click on send, we see that we have the data that we already inserted. So I will just copy this one and I will create or duplicate this tab first and I will perform a post and body row and then JSON. And I will paste this one. So let's say Docker tutorial for beginners test and I will click on send. So here we have this 200. And if I, so now if I click on send, we see that we have the new element getting inserted into the database. And now if I click on send again, I see that I have two elements or two lines. So for example, let's uh, persist a new one. So let's call this one new and I click on send, we see that we have a different ID and if I perform a get request, so we will see the list of, of the inserted elements into our database. Also, let's go ahead and check the logs. We see here that each time we perform something or we perform an operation, we see that we have these logs uh, popping up into for, or from our container. So let's stop this container and let's move to another really interesting topic, which is Docker Compose. So for the Docker Compose part, I will start from the other way around. So I will start by creating the Docker Compose file, make everything work, and then I will move step by step and I will explain each line and each part of the file and what corresponds to what. But first of all, I want to use my Docker desktop to quickly remove all the containers that we have right here. Okay, so I will check it all and then click on delete. 
and then delete forever. So now we ha we no longer have any running containers. Also, I will remove these images and I will keep only my spring demo. Also, I can remove this Redis and I will keep only these two containers that we have. Uh, sorry, the images, not the containers. So we have the Postgres and the spring demo. This is the application that we just um, built. And now let's open our IntelliJ. I will just use it because it has the auto completion and also it's really nice to display the, the structure. So first of all, uh, whatever you want, just go ahead and create a file, call it, uh, sorry, not Java class, it's like old habits, create a file and call it docker-compose.yaml. So this is a Docker Compose file and for Docker Compose, we can create services. So the services are the containers that we want to run. So first of all, we have services and first let's give a service a name. So let's for, call the first one Postgres service, for example, just or, or we can, let's just call it Postgres. And then let's give a name to that container and let's call it Postgres-SQL. And here I'm calling it Postgres-SQL on purpose because if you remember our configuration for the Spring Boot application, we need to connect to a container called Postgres-SQL. And then we need to specify the image. So it's Postgres image, okay? Then we need to pass the environments so the environments, it's a list of environments. And then we have the first one, which is Postgres name, uh, user. And the user should be a username as we specified before. And then we have Postgres password. And the value is password. And then let's expose uh, the ports. So here ports and I want to expose 5432 on 5432. You can also expose multiple ports for the same container, by the way. And then after that, we need to specify volumes. So for the volumes, let's now call it Postgres. And then I will come back to this one later on. So Postgres, it will be on slash etc uh, slash var slash lib slash postgres slash data and then since uh, for the previous uh, videos or the previous part we connected postgres sql and our spring application to the same network so now let's create a network and let's call it spring boot network so this time i will call it network not net and i will show you how we can declare the network so this is the first service and now I will create uh, the second one, which is I will call it Spring Boot App. And this Spring Boot App, I will give it a container name. So I will call it Spring-Demo, for example. And then the image, it's from Spring slash Demo. So this is the image that we already built together. And now we don't need any environments. All I need as next is port. So I want to exp uh, expose it to 8088 on 8080, which is the internal port of my container. So again, we don't need volumes, but we need networks. So for the networks, let's call it also Spring Boot Network. So let's just copy this one. And now in order to create volumes and networks, all we need to do is to specify volumes right here. So the volume, we have this one. So let's call the first one Postgres and then colon, and that's it. So this one will refer or will reference this one. So this is a named volume. And now for the network, in the same way, we will create networks. So let's call it Spring Boot Network. And here we can specify the driver, let's say local. Uh, also, one thing here for this uh, environment, we just forgot an, another environment variable. So first, we don't need this list. And we also, we want to add this Postgres underscore DB, and we called it do demo 
underscore db so this will create a database by default and that's it so just one thing for the for the driver let's make it bridge sorry it was just um, a mistake from my side so the driver name or the driver should be of type bridge so now all we need to do is whether to run this service from here so if you are using IntelliJ, you can just click on this play button otherwise using the terminal right here just let me clean everything and all we need to do is docker dash compose and then up so docker compose app will run all the containers all of them so it will create the first container called postgres and the second container called spring boot and it will give them spring demo name and postgres sql name as container so let's do that So we see that everything is started and also the application is up and running. And as we can see here, the application or the Tomcat, uh, the application is starting or started on the port 8080. So now let's check our running containers. So I will open a new terminal right here and I will do docker ps and here we see that we have this first one is running. So it's spring demo and then we have this postgres sql. So the spring demo is exposed on the port 8088 uh, and the postgres sql is exposed on the port 5432. So now if I use or if I go back and use my postman and I try again this get so here I see that I have a response from my API. Also, I can insert some data. So let's insert this, that, this, that. And now if I go back and I click on send again, I see the list. Also, let me go back to IntelliJ. And now we see also that we have all the logs from our running container. So like this, we have, or we created a Docker Compose file or a file that grouped all the services and the containers that we need to run to make the full application running. So we also saw that we no longer need to create or to map any volumes or to create uh, networks manually and connect them to each other. Docker Compose will do everything for us. So now before we move on to explain everything in here, so there is one small thing that I want to highlight. So for example, we know that before running this application or our front uh, or our REST API, we need to make sure that our database it is up and running and to and to make this one waiting for this one, we can add another parameter. So it depends on and here we just specify the service name. So this Spring Boot app depends on this Postgres SQL, okay? So first we need to wait for this and then it will run the Spring Boot app. So let me show you how this is gonna be. So now to stop a running Docker Compose, we can do Docker Compose Down. So Docker Compose Down, it will stop all the, the containers and also here, so the, this container was removed, this container was removed, and also the network also was removed. So now my terminal here is uh, released. So let's again run this one, but this time in detached mode. So it's docker compose app minus D for detached. And we see that we have creating this, the, first of all, this network, and then we have container Postgres SQL, and then we have the spring demo running. So I will just do docker compose down, and now we are removing all the containers, and I will run again without the detached mode, so I can show you all the logs. So here we see that when we run the Docker Compose app, we see first of all that we are running the Postgres SQL and when the Postgres SQL is up, we started running our Spring Boot application. So now let's move on and let me explain to you in details how we transformed our Docker commands into this Docker Compose file. Now let's understand what a Docker Compose is. So Docker Compose is a tool for defining and running multi-container Docker applications. 
It allows you to manage complex applications consisting of multiple services that depend on each other by using a single declarative YAML file called docker-compose.yaml. So this file describes the services, networks, and volumes that make up the application along with their configurations and enter dependencies. Docker Compose provides a convenient way to create, start, stop, and manage these services as a cohesive unit. So here is an in-depth explanation of Docker Compose and its benefits. So first of all, simplified service management. Docker Compose allows you to manage all the services in your application as a single unit. You can define each service with its container image, environment variables, networking configuration, and other settings in the Docker Compose YAML file. So with a single command such as Docker Compose app, you can start all the services defined in the file, allowing for easy management of complex multi-container application. Then we have reproducible builds. The Docker Compose YAML file serves uh, as a source of truth for your application's configuration, ensuring that each deployment is consistent and re reproducible. This reduces the risk of discrepancies between development, staging, and production environments, leading to fewer surprises and smoother deployments. Then, ease of collaboration. Docker Compose makes it easier to, for teams to collaborate on developing and deploying multi-containers applications. The Docker Compose YAML file can be version controlled, allowing team members to track changes, revert the previous versions, and collaborate on updates. Developers can share the file with other teams, uh, with other team members who can then easily re uh, recreate the application stack on their own machines, ensuring a consistent development experience across the team. Then, isolation and environment consistency. By defining all services, networks, and volumes in the Docker Compose YAML file, you can create isolated environments for your application. This makes it easy to run multiple instances of, of the same application or work on multiple projects without conflicts. Each environment can have its own configuration, ensuring consistency between different stages of the development pipeline. Then, Docker Compose simplified networking. So Docker Compose simplifies the process of setting up container networking. It automatically creates a default network for your application and assigns each service a unique DNS name based on the service name defined in the Docker Compose file. This makes it easy to connect services within the application without having to worry about managing container IP addresses or port mappings. Then, easy scaling. Docker Compose makes it easy to scale services horizontally by changing the de desired number of replicas for a service. You can use the Docker Compose app minus minus scale command to update the Docker Compose file to specify the desired numbers of instances for each service. Docker Compose will then start or stop containers as needed to match the desired scale. It also, also we have simplified logging and monitoring. So Docker Compose provides a unified interface for collecting logs from all services in your application. With the Docker Compose logs command, you can view aggregated logs from all containers, making it easier to debug and monitor the application as a whole. And finally, integration with orchestration platforms. So Docker Compose can be used in conjunction with uh, container orchestration platforms like Kubernetes or Docker Swarm. By using the same Docker Compose YAML file, you can deploy your application on these platforms, leveraging their, advanta the ad their advanced features for scaling, rolling up updates, and self-healing. So to summarize, Docker Compose is a powerful tool for managing multi-container applications, offering benefits such as simplified service management, reproducible builds, ease of collaboration, isolation and environment consistency, simplified networking, easy scaling, and simplified logging and monitoring, and also integration with orchestration platforms. 
So by using Docker Compose, you can streamline the development and deployment process, reducing complexity and improving productivity. So now after understanding what a Docker Compose file is and its benefits for when we want to use it for our application development and deployment, let me explain to you what is the mapping that we made to transform this Docker command to a Docker Compose file. So in the Docker Compose file, we always start with services and then we define each service. So each service is a container that needs to be running in order to have the full application up and running. So in our case, we have a Postgres. So this is the container that we need. And then we have our Spring Boot application that also needs to be running. And then for each container, we have the volumes and we need to connect them to the same network. So let's start from from the bottom. So here we to create a network, we use the command docker network create minus D to define the, the driver, which is bridge and then the network name. So this is this part right here. So we define networks and network should be on the same level as as services. So so you need to be careful about it. So networks and volumes should be at the same level of services. So then we want to create a persistent volume. And in this case, we want to use a named volume as we explained before. So here the command, the Docker command to do that is Docker volume create and then the volume name. So then it, it's represented in the YAML file as volumes and then Postgres and just columns. So we don't need to specify anything else. So this is how we can create networks and volumes. So if you need, for example, a different volume for the Spring Boot application, you can just after Postgres SQL, Postgres, sorry, right here at the same level, you can add, for example, Spring Boot logs or Spring Boot, Spring Boot uh, volumes and so on and so forth. Now let's see how we can transform or what is the, the, the mapping between this Docker command and this Docker compose file. So here what we do is Docker run and then we specify the, the arguments. So for example, here we have the name, the container name. So the name is this one is represented by container underscore name. And then you give it the name that you want to use. And here in this case, make sure that this name is the same one as you specified in your application configuration. And then we have the image. So the image is the last argument that you specify for the Docker run. So we, we type Docker run and then the arguments. And finally, we specify the image that we want to create a container out of it. So here we specify the image, which is Postgres. And then we have a set of environment variables that we need to pass to our container. So in this case, we have the minus E Postgres user, username and password, and also the Postgres database because we want our, uh, we want to create a database at the container uh, run or startup. So this is how we can provide them. So here we have minus E as uh, options. So here we can specify a list of environments. So environment, and then we have Postgres user, Postgres password and Postgres DB. Then we come to the ports. So here for the port, we use minus P or dash P. And then we specify the port on the left hand side is the host on the right hand side is the container port. So here it's, it's represented in the same way. And also we can, we can uh, expose multiple ports. So here it's in the same way, it's a string. So it's uh, on, the on the left hand side is the container port and on the right hand side is the, sorry, the left hand side is the host port and the right hand side is the container port. And then to specify the volume, here we have minus V and then the, the name and then the path. So it's the same way. So it's volumes and then Postgres and then the path. So po this Postgres will refers to this one we specified right here. The same for the network. So we have networks and we can connect one container to multiple networks. So here it, it's, uh, it's the equivalent of minus minus net and then the network name. So here we define networks and then the network name and make sure that this network name is the same one as we defined it 
right here. And also in the same way for the Spring Boot application. So we have a container name, the image, and then the ports. And if we have environment variables, we need to pass them. So we can also pass them. And here we have this depends on. So I already explained that. So this depends on means that we need to wait for this Postgres SQL container to be up and running. And then we start the, the Spring Boot app or the Spring Demo container. So this is how you can transform or this is how you can create a Docker Compose file. So as I mentioned before, Docker Compose makes it easier to configure and do everything without the need to run multiple uh, Docker commands. And also you don't need to master all the commands. All you need is to understand how this Docker Compose file is composed and how to create one. So that's pretty much it. I'm happy you made it to the end of this video. I hope also this video was informative and you got so many information and now you will be able to start working with Docker. Also, don't forget to leave in the comments what other next topics that you want me to, uh, to cover because I always rely on comments and on your motivations and your proposals from the comments to create the next content that you are requiring. Now, before we finish this video, I would like to invite you, if you like my content and if you like this video, don't forget to hit the, to hit the thumbs up button and also hit the subscribe so you can join me. Also, you find everything and all the required links in order to follow me and get updates from me every day. So everything is, is in the description of this video. Thank you so much again and I hope to see you soon.